because this is my happy place in teaching and also in general PT. My happy place is in neuro. I just, nom, 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 give me all the neuro I want. I've got like four neuroscience books sitting here within reach. Neuro to me is phenomenal and amazing and I love it and it makes me happy, happy. Um, it almost makes me like Ren and Simpy, happy, happy, joy, joy, happy. For those of you that know who Ren and Simpy is. Um, and the main reason is with when you, and we're going to get it in heavy next semester, is that neuro is a different type of PT. And I've talked to you briefly about this before, but the interesting thing part about neuro is, number one, no two people do neuro alike. There are so many different theories on neuro. There's NDT, there's sensory integration, SIT. There's all kinds of different neuro theories out there. There's primitive reflex therapy. Um, so it's the neat part is there's so much out there that you can just dabble into and try and kind of build your own repertoire with. But one of the things that always bugged me about being in the clinic at the outpatient clinic is here's my list of exercises. Here's what I'm going to be doing. And I'm going to be doing these same exercises for the next total knee replacement, for the next total knee replacement, for the next total knee replacement. And it just, to me, that repetition numbs my brain. For some people, that's why they like it. They like outpatient because, you know, they, they're, it's, it's kind of a, not, I want to say brainless is not what I want to say. It's kind of just that they, they like that routine. They like the ability to watch these patients. It, it, yeah, routine is a good term, right? For me, that routine is monotonous. And I think it's my ADHD. I really do. Um, I'm just sitting there, I'm like, okay, I need to do something else. And not always, depending on your PT, are you able to do other things? Whereas with neuro, it's not like a PT can come along and give you, here's a treatment I want you to do with a stroke. Because there are 20 different types of strokes. Well, it's more than 20 probably, but there's 20 different types of strokes. And it's going to depend. Are they a right brain stroke or are they a left brain stroke? Are they a spinal cord injury high or are they a spinal cord injury low? Right, a stroke can mean anything. Exactly. So that's the thing is, in neuro, I never do the same thing. I can have, I can have a stroke in 202 and a stroke in 203, and I'm doing totally different things with them. This patient, I'm up walking down the hallway, and we're doing, you know, gaze deviation techniques and stuff like that. Whereas the patient at 203, I'm barely getting to edge of bed. That's why I love neuro. Neuro is just such a, you know, and then some of you will get to neuro and it's just too much. But there's just too much to go along with neuro that you have to remember that it's just way too much. PNF kind of tries to bridge that a little bit. PNF tries to make intro to neuro a little bit easier. So PNF stands for proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation. So let's break that down. What does proprioceptive mean? What does proprioceptive mean? If you're using your proprioceptors. Yeah, where you are in space, right? Proprioceptive perception. So I'm using my proprioceptors right now in my buttocks to tell me which buttock I have the most weight shifted. I'm also going with my baroreceptors as well. I'm using all the air kind of blowing around me to know if I'm leaning one way or if I'm leaning another right. If I lean this way a little bit, I get more of my fan. If I lean this way a little bit, I get less of my fan, but now I can start feeling my balance shifting off. So knowing where you are in space. Neuromuscular. The ability for the nerves and muscles to work in coordination with each other and maybe for the muscles to fire the nerves and the nerves to fire the muscles. Facilitation. What does facilitation mean? If I am facilitating your learning right now. Yeah, bringing into, right? I'm, t I'm teaching, I'm facilitating your learning of PNF right now. You are going to be bringing into life the ability for their nerves and muscles to work together along with knowing where they are in space. That's proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation. 
So what we're going to talk about here in PNF is we're going to talk about the history and definition of PNF. I know there is history in this, and I'm going to tell you, some of this history will be on your boards. This is probably the one area where there's weird history on your boards. And that's only because PNF is so prevalent in our field nowadays. I'll talk about the neurophysio benefits. We'll talk about key points during PNF. Then we'll talk about how to deal with problems with PNF, and then we'll do our patterns, and we'll talk about stretching. So this is a little in-depth lesson. Even though it's only 33 slides, it takes us a little bit to get through this because I just realized one of the slides I didn't maximize. I've got to work on that a little bit. So where did this come from? Well, PNF originally was established or created back in about the 1940s by Herman Kabat, right? Um, have you guys talked about Sherrington yet at all in either Intro to PT, Charles Sherrington, either Intro to PT, or in, uh, what's the other one you're doing right now? Rehab, who Charles Sherrington is? That name even remotely ring a bell? Okay. So Charles Sherrington was a neurophysicist or physicist. And he was one that gave us a lot of our common muscular, neuromuscular terms that we deal with, like reciprocal inhibition, um, active and passive insufficiency, stuff like that. He was really interested in how the body worked and how that body worked in relation to the brain. So Kabat was a heavy, heavy, heavy follower of Sherrington's early work, especially the reciprocal inhibition. Did you guys learn about reciprocal inhibition? Does that term sound familiar? Okay, so let's cover that first then. Uh, so reciprocal inhibition is where if you fire one muscle, that muscle being the agonist moving the body, there is a contralateral antagonist that is inhibited. That's a lot of mumbo jumbo. What it's literally saying is if I fire my biceps to flex my elbow, my triceps are being inhibited by my body so they don't fire. So this is going into that muscular or the, the muscle, the, that action potential curve that you learned about in anatomy. When I'm firing an action potential on my biceps, my triceps are going to be hyperpolarized or hypodepolarized, where they're in that really big dip down bottom where they can't fire. That's the goal of it. Because what they want is, if I'm, firing, if I'm firing my biceps and my triceps are firing at the same time, I'm not going to get anywhere. So if I fire my biceps, my triceps have to relax. If I fire my triceps, my biceps have to relax. Does that make sense for reciprocal inhibition? Okay, good. Then let's just review passive and active insufficiency because those are going to come into play. Active insufficiency, the muscle can no longer what? If it's actively insufficient, it can't get any, yeah, it can't get any smaller, it can't get any flex, it can't shorten anymore, whatever you want, whatever one of those terms you want to use. The muscle is as short as it can be, right? Versus passive insufficiency, now the muscle is what? Passive the muscle is as long as it can go, right? Can't stretch anymore. So Kabat came along, he had all those principles that Sherrington kind of worked with and said, well, let's see what we can do. So then he, he got this Maggie Knott lady, thought she was something good, but she's not. Ah, 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 no, I love my jokes. They're so great. Aren't they? I mean, come on. So, you know, not came along, worked with Kabat on this type of stuff, and they really looked at the way that the brain and body work. There's also Voss who came in. The main thing you have to know for history-wise is Kabat is kind of the father of PNF. And they started treating polio patients. Why do you think in the 40s they were treating polio patients? Why, why, do you, why was it in the 40s and not nowadays? 
Yeah, no vaccine, right? We used to call polio the great crippler of young adults. Because once you got it, you were done. You pretty much wasted away. Yeah, I mean, you could get all the way to paralyzation, but most of the time, you weren't even lucky enough to get paralyzed. It just completely wasted your body so much that you wish you were paralyzed. Right? I've actually had a polio patient to tell me that once. He's like, you know, I just wish that my legs would just become paralyzed because that way I have no hope of them ever working. Right? Because one day his legs are okay and maybe he can do stuff, but the next day he can't. And that's really frustrating for patients with polio, right? But then we developed the vaccine and we've all but eradicated it. But now, oh, anti-vaxxer, anti-vaxxer, anti-vaxxers. So before PNF, patients were rehabilitated using one motion, one joint, one muscle at a time, right? I talked briefly about this in functional motion. We talked about scaption, right? That we don't move this way. Right? We move in diagonals and we move in rotationals. Well, back in the 40s when we did PT, we worked one direction. We were almost as bad as the band at being kind of dogmatic. Moved in one direction, worked one muscle at a time, and that was it. So if you were coming in for the shoulder, we worked a whole session on shoulder flexion. That's great, but that's not functional, right? So Kabat and his follower, or his people, did these observations and looked that patterns of movement were consistent with neurophysiological theory showing that we don't move in straight lines. Even walking, we're not moving in a straight line. There's rotational and diagonal components that go along with it. So it led him to realize that patients move in spiral diagonal patterns. Almost every motion we do, even me just scratching my nose there, was a spiral diagonal pattern. It wasn't a pure, just straight, right? If I need to scratch my nose, it's not like I go elbow flexion, shoulder flexion, horizontal adduction, closed fist, elbow flexion, scratch, scratch, scratch. That's not the way we work, right? We are not robots. Maybe someday we will be, but right now we're not. So Kabat and not believe that this natural pattern of movement would stimulate the nervous system more than traditional isolated therapy. Their thought process was, well, what happens if instead of treating patients like a robot, we treat them like a human? Now, in today's day and age, that doesn't sound too uh, revolutionary, does it? That sounds normal. But back in, back in the day, right, for them to do this type of stuff, this was revolutionary, right? This was as revolutionary as like a total knee replacement or something like that. This was, you know, the, and you can imagine what their pushback was in the physical therapy community, right? Here comes this, you know, like nowadays, we'd be like, here comes this hippie coming along telling me that we're going to do stuff in rotational and diagonal patterns, and my straight line patterns have always worked, right? There was a lot of pushback for them. Um, uh, before I go on, a lot of the motion he learned, he learned from watching Shaolin monks. Uh, he had taken a bunch of trips overseas and really looked at the way medicine was done overseas in Japan and China versus the way medicine is done here in the United States. And he realized that, you know, watching them move and watching them do Tai Chi and moving different motions, you know, like Kung Fu, that the amount of force they can generate from following natural body patterns is amazing. And I, if Erica was here, she would actually attribute to this, is that almost, you know, a lot of our martial arts actually used to be linear only. It was straight line, that was it. But we realized that we can generate in martial arts a lot more force by adding rotational and torsional components to it that allow for a lot more force, right? When we did punches in the martial arts, it used to be a straight on punch like this until we realized by rotating the fist over, we actually can get rotational torque along with it and get more force. Same idea here. He's like, well, what if we add those rotational components? And he's like, the light bulb comes on. So we talked about proprioceptor, for it is a stimulus around an organism through the movement of the tissue. It has to do with sensory receptors that give us where we are in space, right? Neuromuscular pertaining to the nerves and body and facilitation, the hastening of any natural progress. 
the actual making of it easier, right? That is what my job is as an instructor. I am to facilitate your learning, to make it as easy as possible. With this lecture, I'm doing the exact opposite, but at least you're learning something, right? This lecture doesn't make it very easy, but this is not an easy topic. And I'm trying to distill like about a six to eight week PNF course down into one or two lectures. So it's a little difficult. So we're gonna, Voss said, we're gonna try to promote or hasten the response of the neuromuscular mechanism through stimulation of proprioception. So she's saying, we're gonna try to get the muscles to fire by changing the body position. Pretty good idea. And then they said that, you know, methods used to place specific demands on muscles in order to elicit a desired response. You know, I'm sitting here scratching my head right now and I keep doing motions that are weird so that you can see this. There are a ton of motions that are just going into me scratching my head like this. It's not, eh, 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 right? There's some components going on when I'm scratching because we have those rotational components. So the key term, one of the big terms you have to understand for PNF and for your boards for PNF is irradiation, right? Irradiation says energy is channeled from stronger muscles into weaker muscles or patterns. This is the entire concept of PNF. Like, and it's not the patterns, it's everything that PNF stands for. PNF is saying, if my biceps aren't firing right, can I get my deltoids to fire my biceps? Or if my biceps aren't firing, can I get my finger flexors to fire my biceps? And what we found is sometimes you actually can. And it's pretty wild. The, ter the other term they have here is success successive induction. An increased response to the agonist after contraction of the antagonist. This is what we're gonna use when we do stretching where we will fire the antagonist in order to relax the agonist or to fire the agonist. And we'll use that reciprocal inhibition I just talked about to fire one or the other. This is where it starts getting into heavy. And then we have that reciprocal inhibition, which I've talked about. So remember with this, the big terms kind of you have to get, you have your radiation, but you also have to get the agonist and the antagonist terms. So the agonist, is the muscle that is causing the motion. So let's look, I'm gonna slide back here. I do hip flexion. What are my agonists? What are my primary two agonists? The muscles doing the motion for hip flexion. Hip flexion. Quads, right? Quads and what big muscle? So quads and what big muscle in the hip? So as I was saying, right? Iliopsoas. So those are my big muscles that are causing my hip flexion. That would be my agonist. What would be, I know, I know, Jar. You've got this one though, Jar. What would be my antagonist? Hamstrings and, come on, Jerry, you got this. What other one's gonna be my antagonist? You just said it. Glutes, yay, you got one, right? This is where it comes into play. Cause when we get into stretching, we're gonna talk about agonist contract and antagonist contract, and you have to get that. So I'm gonna do one more example. So I am going into, and just talk groups here. You don't have to give me specifics. I'm going into internal rotation. Which group is allowing me to do internal rotation? Which is my agonist? My internal rotators, right? It's a group. Let's not totally, I'm not asking between supraspinatus and spinatus and all that yet. So as I go into internal rotation, my internal rotators are my agonists. What are my antagonists then? Which muscles are resisting? Yeah, the external rotators, right? 
that's kind of the idea here we're talking about with reciprocal inhibition. If I have one muscle going, activating, causing the motion, there's another group or another muscle causing the other side, right? So if I abduct my thumb, what muscles are causing me, which are my agonists? My thumb, if I abduct it, my thumb abductors are my agonists. My thumb adductors are my antagonists. That's kind of the thought process. So let's do one in the neck here, because that way we can see it. If I rotate and laterally bend, what muscle is that? What muscle is responsible for rotation and lateral flexion? SCM, good. Right? So if I fire my left SCM, that is my agonist. What is my antagonist? The right one. Good. Right? And that's going to come into play when we talk about Rynak or torticollis. I don't know if any of you did the project on Rynak, so it's another term for it. Sorry, that's my, the old form of me, right? Rynak. So Rynak equals torticollis. So when we talk about babies, we're going to talk about them having kind of that posture like this. And to reverse it, we've got to go this way. Sounds like a pasta shape. It does sound like, don't you mention it? I didn't think about that. We're going to have torticollis with meat sauce tonight. Autogenic inhibition, we're going to talk about GTO stimulation. Let us, let's get to the GTO in a second. I think it's the next thing we're going to talk about because that's where we get different. Actually, GTO is coming up. So just hold on to GTO stimulation for a few minutes. We're going to come back to it. So I talked about Sherrington's study, right? And interestingly enough, he built off Descartes' study, right? And there's a lot of, there's a lot of things that go on with him, um, you know, we're not even going to talk about Renee's kind of research, but Sherrington built off of him. So Liddell Sherrington, who are the two groups working, I came up with this Liddell Sherrington reflex, a tonic contraction of a muscle in response to it being stretched. We're going to talk about that in a second. Don't totally freak out about these laws. That is the myotatic reflex. Sherrington's second law was the law of reciprocal inhibition. God, this looks a lot like Newton, right? Um, and then his first law was every posterior spinal nerve root supplies a particular area of the skin. So looking at this, Sherrington's first law, every posterior spinal nerve root supplies a particular area of the skin with overlapping dermatones. His first law gave us dermatones, right? His myotonic reflex or myotatic reflex gave us myotones. So he really is the father of neuro-PT. Um, he had these other ones. So the ones that are below there in the kind of fine print aren't so hard. You don't have to remember those as much. The Liddell Sherrington and the Sherrington second law are really big for you to know for PT. So Liddell Sherrington reflex says that if a muscle gets stretched, if you stretch it too far, it'll contract. And Sherrington second law says when one muscle's fired, the other muscle relaxes. Um, some of the stuff we're going to, we do use in like neuro PT for the spine is this shift Sherrington reflex. The rigid extension of the upper extremities in response to damage of the spinal cord is accompanied by paradoxal respiration. So if I have spinal cord damage and my extremities go into this posture here called decerebrate posturing, the chest expands and because that chest expands, I'm not able to breathe as normal. So I get paradoxal respiration. It's not as important for you to know, but it is important when we get into spinal cord injuries. And then the volpian hindin sherrington phenomenon, which everyone remembers, is the slow contraction of denervated skeletal muscles by using autonomic cholinergenic fibers innervating its blood vessels. What? Well, what that's saying is that we can use e-stim to fire dead muscles. That doesn't make that muscle contraction functional, but it just says that we can use that to fire those muscles. If 
you are worried about all these laws. These are the two you need to know. These are the, Mr. McKeever is a neuro nerd and they're FYI. These are the neuro nerd facts. You know, because, you know, people like me that work in neuro and hang out with other people in neuro, we spend all day sitting around speaking about the Volpian, Hinden, Sherrington phenomenon. It's just something, sounds like something from the Big Bang Theory to me, honestly. But I could see Sheldon talking about it. So this is where we talked, I talked about that uh, Golgi tendon or GTO inhibition. We're going to talk about myotatics versus inverse myotatic. The stretch reflex versus the Golgi tendon reflex. Your boards are mean with these questions. I'm going to be 100% honest for you. You have to associate myotatic with stretch reflex and inverse myotatic with GTR because they will ask you questions talking about the stretch reflex and then they'll use the myotatic answers to confuse you. It's a really, really mean thing, but there are some therapists out there that are really, really mean test writers, and they think that everyone should know the difference between these. So first of all, both of these are going to work based upon different sensory receptors in the muscle. So you have your muscle spindles and your GTOs, or your Golgi tendon organs. Did you talk briefly about these in anatomy? He usually covers them way high level. Did he talk about the GTOs and the muscle spindles? Okay. So where are your muscle spindles at? Where are your muscle spindles at? Where do you think? Put that away before I play with it for the next 20 minutes. The muscle spindles close. That's more GTOs. Those are GTOs. Yes, in the muscle belly, the muscle spindle, right? When you think of a spindle, it's inside of it. So the muscle spindles are in the muscle belly versus the GTOs, Golgi tendon organs. Where do you think those are? In the tendons. I know. It's almost like it says it. It's important to understand that. So if I'm looking at my bicep here, my muscle spindles are here. My GTOs are here and here. They're going to send different information. So the stretch reflex or the myotatic reflex involves the muscle spindles. What it says is when the agonist muscle lengthens, the stretch reflex causes the agonist muscle to contract to resist the stretching. And I like using biceps because it just makes things easier to talk about. So what it's saying is, if you are stretching me out, my muscle spindles are detecting that stretch going on, right? So there's, I'm getting into full biceps length. Actually, I got to go way back here too, but I want to be able to show it. So I'm getting the full biceps length here, right? The muscle spindles are saying, okay, dude, we're getting to the point you're starting to get a stretch. Okay, 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 oh, 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 oh. And if you stretch hard enough, if I get way back here, I can't do it to myself because I'll guard. The muscle spindles are gonna say, hey, stop it. You're going too far and will cause a reciprocal contraction. Why is it going to try to contract? What are the muscle spindles trying to do? Protect it, yeah. They're trying to keep you from tearing the muscle apart. Does that make sense? Okay, so that is the myotatic reflex. When a muscle gets stretched out, there are the muscle spindles try to keep you from tearing apart that muscle. The GTOs are going to fire a little bit in that, but not so much. They're usually inhibited at that point. 
Now, the GTR reflex, which goes, if you have to think about it, the inverse myotatic reflex goes with the Golgi tendon reflex. This is the way I remembered it for my boards. Inverse myotatic reflex has three words. Golgi tendon reflex has three words. Myotatic reflex has two words. Stretch reflex has two words. Right? The stretch reflex is my muscle spindles, which are two words. The GTR, the G Golgi tendon reflex, is the Golgi tendon organs, which has three words. That was my way of remembering these for the boards. Because when I went through this, I remember literally sitting there like, if this was a white flag, I'm waving it to Dr. Borromeo going, I, I give up. I think I'm going to go become a greeter at Walmart, please. until I figured out that I could number it. And when I got to the numbering of it, it makes sense. Then I just had to learn what they meant, but at least I could associate them. So with the Golgi tendon reflex, with agonist muscle contraction, the GTR causes agonist muscle lengthening into, or with regards to greater stimuli. So what it's saying is, if I'm doing bicep curls, right? Let me get a get something to fire off my biceps here. Oh, I got here we go. I got a theraband here, right? So if I'm doing bicep curls, my bicep says, "Okay, that's not bad. I can do that." Okay, that's getting a little worse, right? So I'm shortening this up now. I'm gonna really shorten this band up. Now, that's getting really difficult, right? Because I can't get it to contract. If I keep pulling, what do you think is going to happen? Or what could happen if I just keep forcing myself to pull? So here I am. Yeah, the muscle is going to eventually say, this is too much, right? No, this is too much. And it's going to relax. You all have seen this at the gym, or you may have even had it happen to you at the gym, right? Where you've seen somebody doing something and they just get to the point where it's too much weight and all of a sudden their arms just do what? Boom, yeah, right? And they sometimes when that happens, you just stand there going, what the heck just happened? Because that, yeah, lunk, right? Boom. And then you're sitting there and you look at, and I've seen it before at the gym where I've seen guys doing, you know, huge bicep curls. And all of a sudden, thwunk, there goes some weight. And for a few minutes, those lunkheads are staring at their arm going, why you betray me? Right? Well, what it is, yeah, it can happen. Yep, absolutely. What that is, is the Golgi tendons are saying, if we contract any more, you are going to rip me off of the bone. They're literally screaming, help, help, He's, he or she's contracting too much. Stop it. And they're going to cause the muscle to just relax and extend. That's actually pretty cool when you think about it. Your muscle has built-in receptors to prevent you from lengthening too much and shortening too much so that you can continue to function as a human being. Um, it is less sensitive than the myotatic reflex, but here's the thing. That GTO is strong enough that it can override the stretch reflex. So what that says is, even if you're, that weight is so heavy that when you get out here, your arm would actually naturally contract to prevent it from overstretching, that muscle won't fire. That can lead to other problems, couldn't it? Because now the GTO, Golgi tendon reflex has inhibited the stretch reflex. Now my arm drops rapidly. Now I can tear right in the muscle, right? So I want to hit these again, just so that we can fry our brains here efficiently. Let's talk, um, let's use, 
wrist extensors, okay? How would I fire my stretch reflex? If we're talking, this is my motion I would normally do. Wrist extension. What motion would I move myself into to fire my stretch reflex? What motion is gonna move me to stretch them? This is contract. Well, that's contract, right? Which is stretch then. Yeah, down here. So if I push this way, eventually you can get a little bit of a rebound. Let's see if I can get it to fire here. Whee, fun. It's science. Beep. Right? It's a combination of tension in the muscle along with those uh, myotatic sensors in there going, hey, idiot, you're stretching me too far. I had this happen once when I was doing uh, a straddle in the martial arts. I thought I was being really cool and I was really pushing myself. And I told my friend, I said, can you come over and push me down on the lateral aspects of my hip? And he put a lot of weight down into pushing me into a further straddle. And I, it went down so far that all of a sudden my hip adductors just fired and like basically shot me almost straight up. I remember that back in the martial arts vividly when I was a kid. And I was like, that was just weird. I didn't know about the stretch reflex back then, but that's what it was. So then the inverse myotatic or the gold tendon reflex, we actually have to be doing the motion. Let me get my little handy dandy TheraBand here. I have to be doing the motion and overloading the muscles. That's not enough to overload. Let's see if I can get it to overload. There. Right, that's kind of what happens with the Golgi tendon reflex. So stretch reflex, you're stretching the muscle. Golgi tendon reflex, you are contracting the muscle. Do those make somewhat sense? Do we need another example or how are we feeling on those? That's fine. Um, let me think. Let's do flexion, neck flexion. That'll work. We're gonna do neck flexion. So my agonist motion is neck flexion. That's the way I'm going. In order to trigger the stretch reflex, what direction do I go in to stretch my neck flexors? Back here, right? So you're gonna come in and you start applying force going backwards. Now, it won't happen with me because my prosthetic's eventually gonna lock in, but you're gonna come here and stretch me like this. And eventually all these muscles in my flexors are gonna say, hey, idiot, you're too far. And the muscle spindles right now are screaming, right? So I'm pushing, I'm pushing. The muscle spindles are saying, ow, ow, ow. And then eventually they're gonna scream so loud the muscle is going to contract. So I'm going to be pushing, 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 and I'm going to do one of those. I'm going to get three chins or four chins, depending upon how much it is. Four chins for four chin. So that is the stretch reflex. The GTR Golgi tendon reflex, you can also think of it as the contract reflex. So now, I've got my TheraBand here. Let's try to shorten it up some. So I've got it tight across my forehead and I'm flexing down. And that quiver that you see is part of that Golgi tendon reflex, right? Have you ever gotten that when you're lifting and you get that going on? That is part of your Golgi tendon reflex firing. So here I've got this, I've got it across my forehead. I'm going into flexion. Eventually what is going to happen if I overload those tendons? They're gonna cause it to what? 
Eventually, they're going to push and push and push until they can't push anymore, and then it's going to relax, and my head's going to go back that way again because I don't want to overload those muscles. Does that make sense? At least in theory, does it make sense? Sure, I can redo the wrist one. Absolutely. Let's change the wrist up and let's do flexion this time. I think that confused, I think extension is sometimes difficult for people. So my agonist, uh, let me slide back here. There we go. My agonist motion is wrist flexion. Your hamstring's another one, yeah, right? My agonist motion is wrist flexion. In order to get a stretch on my wrist flexors, I have to go into wrist extension, right? So in order to trigger the stretch reflex, I'm going to come back here and I'm going to pull and 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 pull. And then I get that happening. That is an example of the stretch reflex. Does that make sense for stretch reflex then? Now for the GTR or the inverse myotatic, or you could call it even the inverse stretch reflex or the contract reflex, I need a force. I have really good body mechanics here with this. So now I'm lifting something into wrist flexion. I'm cheating. Can't cheat. How do I stop myself? There we go. So I'm going to pull and pull and pull and pull and pull and pull until I can't pull anymore. And when it senses that there's damage to the possible to those tendons, it's going to send me into relaxation. And again, the problem with that one is when I go into relaxation, it overrides the stretch reflex. So I can actually still tear the muscle belly. Does that help? Because we're going to go over these when we talk about stretching too. Because this is stuff we're going to use in PNF stretching. We're going to use these little tricksters. GTR always has a force. Yeah, you have to be going into the direction. You like this, see? These are some cool things because we're going to use these then to trick the body. It's actually pretty cool. We're going to use some GTRs and some... Uh, SRs to allow muscles to relax so we can stretch them better. And this is the part where Mr. McKeever breaks out his wizard hat and his magical wand, and we would normally show with the hamstring, and it's amazing how much difference you can get with hamstring when we fire these. So here's kind of that picture, right? So our muscle spindles are right there in the muscle belly. Most of the time, the muscle spindles are gonna be close to the neuromuscular junction. So the neuromuscular junction is where that nerve dives into the muscle. That kind of makes sense because the muscle spindles wanna be as close to the nerve so it can send a return signal to the brain if we need to fix things. So what are goals of PNF? Because that's the main thing we're always looking at when we're dealing with any type of therapy. The goals of PNF is to restore or enhance postural responses or normal patterns of motion in a patient with deficient neuromuscular mechanism. And actually just this morning at about seven o'clock, I had a PT I know contact me, that's a hand therapist, and she's working with a patient that has um, a spinal cord injury their C5, C6 incomplete spinal cord injury. And she's out of ideas of what to work with this patient. And I said, why don't you work PNF with the patient? And she hadn't even thought of doing PNF with the patient because that's a perfect patient to work with because they've got dis, you know, a deficient neuromuscular mechanism. So we can use this to trigger functional mechanisms. It may be used to enhance stability or mobility. But remember, doesn't matter if we're talking PNF, whether we're talking exercise, whether we're talking CrossFit. You have to be stable before you can be mobile. You have to be stable before you can be mobile. 
you have to have stability before you start working on mobility, right? Let's say I don't have any core strength at all. Um, every time you have me sitting up, I'm kind of wobbling all around. Do you want to get me up and walking? Nope. You're going to spend all your day, you know, with me going, okay, do you feel yourself leaning forward? Come on, come on, come on, come back. Nice up and tall. Uh-oh, you're falling backwards, Mr. McKeever. Come back forwards. You're going to work on my stability first before you ever get me out of bed. Because think about it. If I'm like this when I'm sitting, and now you get me up walking, I look like I'm drunk. And you're going to end up with a fall. So you've got to be stable before you can be mobile. And then once you're mobile, you can be hostile. Maybe use the strengthen or stretch muscle groups. So we're going to talk about that because we PNF is usually thought as a strengthening tool, but it's also a stretching tool. Can be used to improve posture, balance, and coordination, which is amazing. This is why PNF is cool. It can be used for everything. It is literally like the wrench that fits everything, right? I always joke there was um, for a while back in, I think it was the late 90s, Craftsman made this socket set that had a bunch of ball bearings in it. And it didn't matter what size the nut was, you could use one piece of socket and it went down and it grabbed a hold of that nut. Didn't matter what it was. This is kind of like that tool. It grabs a hold of whatever. This is kind of like our, uh, uh, you know, our vice grips for everything. They did grab a hold of whatever. We can use it. Maybe use with patients with normal or abnormal cognitive abilities. So this can be even used in patients that are irritated, irritable, that aren't there. It's the WD-40. It really is the WD-40 of... PAT. So key points in PNF procedures, manual contacts are going to be big. And when I say manual contacts, the more that you can touch your patient and touch them appropriately, the better your outcome is going to be. Because PNF is a manual therapy, you need to get hands on, they need to feel you. And you'll find when I'm doing PNF, not only do I have my hands on them, but usually my hip or my shoulders on them as well. I want to have maximal contact so I can feel how the body is reacting as well. Dr. Reskin, who works more with athletes and the dance people, her PNF is a little different than my PNF because, well, you know, I don't know if you've ever done, you know, exercises with somebody that's actually fit and you're resisting their exercises. They have a lot more force than somebody that's a stroke. Right? I've done PNF with uh, linebackers before, and it's a totally different world than somebody that's a stroke or a spinal cord injury. So the contacts over the muscle groups that facilitate the muscle group to contract. So we're going to be touching their muscles and guarding their joints. The key grip we're going to use is this grip. What's this grip called again? <laughs> The duck grip, right? Or what muscles are doing it? Do you remember? Well, pincher grip is this. Do you remember what intrinsic muscles are causing this grip? Hint, it's on the slide. It's the lumbrical grip. Remember? Because you've got those lumbrical muscles that are allowing you to do this. So this is lumbrical grip, meaning when I'm grabbing a hold of the patient's arm, this is a flashlight, but it's going to work. When I'm on the patient's arm, I want to grip like that. I don't want this. I don't want this. I don't want this. I want a maximal contact grip on their arm. This allows me to control that arm a lot better. It also allows the patient, if they need to slide in my hand to get some more motion, they have the ability to slide. If I'm here, they're kind of locked in. Here's the other side of it. Depending upon your school of PNF, your hand positions will be different. So that doesn't mean that that there is one hand position to rule them all, one hand position to bind them, one hand position to bring them all in the darkness, bind them. The hand positions vary based upon what you're trying to do. 
Neuro hand positions are a little different than athletic hand positions. But what you will find is a hand position when we're doing this that works for you. I'm never going to tell you guys your hand position isn't the best unless it's something that's a safety concern. If the hand positions you use gets your technique down, use those hand positions. And somebody else is probably doing the same thing. I will teach you my hand positions and where I put my hands, but sometimes it doesn't work for people. And that's when Dr. Reskin usually comes in and backs me up and she shows hers and they're like, oh, that makes more sense than Mr. McKeever's ludicrous stuff. Great, I can be ludicrous, I'm fine with that. Stand up. Manual and maximal resistance. So when we're providing, I, think I made Jara laugh at least, thank God. When we're providing resistance, the direction, quality, and quantity of resistance is adjusted to promote a smooth and coordinated response, whether it's for stability or mobility. Meaning, you're not going to have hitching going on when you're doing this activity. If there's hitching, you're, if you're putting so much force that when they're moving through the patterns, they're doing one of these. That means you are applying what? Too much force. You've got to back the force off until you get a nice smooth motion. The key to PNF is smooth rotational diagonal motion, not right, not cogwheel motion. That's what that's called. That's called cogwheel motion, where you get that kind of hitching going on. So we're going to talk about cogwheel motion with, with uh, patients that have Parkinson's. But if you're getting that where it's kind of clicking as they're going through, and I can even shake my whole body doing that, that's not, enough, that's not a smooth motion. You need to back down your resistance a little bit. If you're not doing any resistance and it's all passive, you don't have to worry about that because passive, or passive motion has no resistance. But when you get into that resisted portion, because this is kind of our, what do I want to, how do I want to term it? This is kind of our failure sometimes as a PTA and a PT, is we want to apply maximal resistance so that patient gets stronger, right? They've got to get stronger. Think about it. When you see guys at the gym, they're constantly lifting too much, right? And sometimes it looks like they're having a seizure on the floor. They will get more out of their lifts if they're able to do smooth motions than if they're like, I got this. And they're bearing down doing that, what's that, the bear down called again? What's this called? Valsalva, good, right? You get more out of it if you're not getting that hitching and Valsalva maneuver going on because the patient's neuromuscular system will respond better. When applying resistance, you have to consider the treatment goal. Are we going for power or are we going for endurance? If we're going for endurance, we may not ever get to maximal resistance. We may stay at moderate minimal resistance. If we're going for power, yeah, we're eventually going to get to max resistance that the patient can tolerate. But this is the big one. Quality of movement is more important than strength of movement. They should be doing the full motion properly before we add extra resistance. And then watching spasticity, right? Spasticity can be that hitching, but it can also be where the muscle locks up on them. The last thing you want to do if you've got a patient that has spasticity is cause them to lock up now where they're here and now you can't get them out of it to work them. Irradiation we talked about a little bit, it's called overflow. This is the spread of energy from the prime agonist to complementary agonist and antagonist within a pattern. This is where it comes off of that kind of um, Eastern medicine, Eastern philosophy idea, right? Because what's, what's the term for energy in Eastern medicine? Does anyone know? We all have a natural energy that flows around us. Anyone ever studied that type of stuff? Yes, chi or ki or kai, depending upon where we are, right? 
So it depends upon where your philosophy is at, whether it's in the Philippines, whether it's in Japan, whether it's Vietnam, whether it's Korea, whether it's China. They all have a little bit different term for it. But it's this natural energy that goes around us. So much so that we have actually scientifically documented that energy now. We don't know what it is. We don't know how to tap into it. They know how to, for some reason, some people know how to tap into it, but we don't understand it scientifically yet. But, you know, I've, I've gone overseas and I've, because I, I, I did a couple tours. I've done China, I've done South Korea, I've done Japan. And I've watched monks put their arms through wheat grinders and pull their arms out and push their arms through wheat grinders. And has anyone ever seen what a wheat grinder looks like? So a wheat grinder are these two huge stones. And I've seen them push their hands through those two huge stones and pull their arms out without any injury. So that's that energy our natural body has. So we want to kind of work on flowing that natural body energy from weaker muscles to stronger muscles and from stronger muscles to weaker muscles. That's where that flow comes into play. That's that irradiation or overflow. So here again, energy channel from stronger to weaker muscles in groups or patterns can occur either proximally to distally or distally to proximally. Like Dr. Reskin showed up. Hi, Dr. Reskin. Somebody's tapping at my window. I guess they're listening to my lecture. Uh, can be stimulated through therapist resistance. So we can actually stimulate this irradiation of muscles by adjusting our resistance and by adjusting our hand position, our lumbrical grips. It's bilateral combination of extremity motions have different effects in the trunk. So it's interesting. We can use the same motion of both extremities to trigger either flexion or extension. So if I bring my arms inward, my trunk naturally kind of flexes in. If I bring my arms outward, my trunk naturally extends. That's symmetrical bilateral movement. If I do asymmetrical where I extend with one arm and flex with the other, I get a rotational component going on. And a little bit of lateral bending can go with it, right? Now I'm doing dance. And then cross diagonals can provide a stabilizing, right? So when I do cross diagonal motions, right, it can bring my core in and stabilize my core. So it's all about irradiating the body and not like Chernobyl irradiation, but like muscle irradiation. We're going to use that irradiation to fire things. I'll never forget the first time this worked for me was when I was on a clinical affiliation and my PT was talking to me. I had learned about PNF in school, but my PT is like, go work with that stroke patient, see if you can get her to open her hand. Her hand was kind of gnarled like this. And so we were doing one of the PNF patterns and we're going and we're going and all of a sudden I go up and out and her hand, you can't see it here, her hand just suddenly goes whoop. The energy had flowed from her core muscles out to her distal muscles and had actually opened and extended her fingers. And the patient was staring at her hand like it wasn't her hand. She was like, how did, the, how did you do that? I haven't been able to open my fingers like that for a couple days now. It was the energy flowing from muscle to muscle to kind of allow that to happen. And we're going to talk about that when we get into the patterns coming up. Verbal cueing is important. But let's look at one of my patterns here, which we call drawing the sword pattern, right? D2. So D2 comes from here, up and out, here, up and out. If I'm going to the patient, okay, so I want you to extend your fingers. Now that you extended your fingers, you're going to extend your wrist. And once you extend your wrist, you're going to start extending your elbow. And so you start extending your elbow, and you're going to flex your shoulder. Your shoulder's going to keep coming up. Then you're going to abduct your shoulder and externally rotate your shoulder and come all the way up and out here. The patient goes, what? Some of you are going, what? We are going to keep very simple, very, Buster Rhymes over here, yeah, for a twister, but we'll go with it. Right? We're going to keep the terms very simple, 
very short and very matter to the fact, right? They should be appropriate to the patient's needs. We also got to think we're going to be working with patients with cognitive impairments. If they have a cognitive impairment, we may have to adjust our feedback, right? You give the person that's got, uh, you know, that is RLA4, which is one of the le level of cognitive functioning scale where they're confused and agitated. And you give that level of command I just gave, you're going to get backhanded with the other arm because you just sent them into this spiral. And it's not that they wanted to backhand you. You just literally made them backhand you because you frustrated them. Simple commands, quiet voice. This is one of the areas that I'm challenged on. Dr. Avreskin has a perfect voice for this. When I hear her doing PNF, that's so much. I'm like, I wish I could bring my voice down to her level. I can't. But that quiet, relaxed voice really helps them concentrate on what they're doing. And then as we get greater recruitment of muscles, we can bust up that voice level and kind of bring it up. Okay, good, 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 good. And relax. And push, 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 push. And relax. Most of the terms are going to be along the lines of hold, relax, push, pull, down and in, up and out, up and in, down and out. Notice those terms are very, very mild. You're not going to go into shoulder flexion, abduction. It's just, okay, we're going to go down and in. Now we're going up and out, right? So we're going to go down and in. Now we're going up and out, down and in up and out and it helps them remember where they're going push and pull is important for pnf you pull things to your body you push things away from your body pull towards push away so in this pattern here pull push pull push so it's important to understand those things. And that's actually going to come into play with your wheelchairs too, right? Have you guys started talking about wheelchairs with Dr. Sokel yet? Right? Because if I get my hands on the wheelchair and I pull, what am I going to do in the wheelchair? So my hands are here and I pull on that wheelchair. Which way am I going to go? Yeah, I'm going to go backwards. Whereas if I push on the wheelchair, I'm going to propel forwards. If you're standing there telling the patient, okay, pull that wheelchair and come towards me, their brain's going to fry. So push and pull is important to understand, right? Are you going to always get it right? Absolutely not. I make mistakes. I know it's amazing, but I do make mistakes. You just correct them as soon as possible and make sure that you're able to understand that. Visual cueing is important as well. At all times, the patient should be able to visualize the limb you're moving. That can be really difficult with the leg. So you may have to prop them up into a semi-recumbent position so that they can see their leg. But sometimes when you move them in that position, that limits your full range of motion. So you have to be thinking about that when you're working with patients. Um, I just saw one of the hospitals down in uh, Tucson actually put in video cameras in the PT gym so where they, patients can watch themselves on the screen so they can see what they're doing. It's actually pretty cool, right? As long as the patient's okay with them watching. It's not recording, but it's a nice thing that, you know, if they don't have full neck motion or something like that, they can watch what they're doing and see it while they're laying down. Approximation and traction. Right? So we talked about this briefly with open pack and closed packed, right? Approximation is the compression of joint surfaces. It facilitates co-contraction around the joints and approximation equals stability. Approximation equals stability equals what form of position of the joint? Is approximation going to be closed packed or open packed? The stability is in which position? Closed pack. Very good. Yes. Yay. I'm happy. I told you, I love this neuro stuff. This is like my favorite stuff in the whole wide world. Versus traction or distraction is where this joint surfaces are going to be separated, right? And it can be used to reduce, reduce pain sometimes. But the main idea is to facilitate movement or help with mobility. That's okay, Tyler. 
Um, you know, I, I keep an eye on it. Thank you for letting me know. And like I said, it's recording, so we've got it. So traction is going to help with mobility, right? You learned about this in modalities, right? What kind of traction did you learn about in modalities? What kind of traction? Yeah, cervical and one other one, I hope. Lumbar, okay, good. Let's make it sure, right? Cervical and lumbar traction. And hopefully when we get back to full campus, we can get you guys down and actually see the machines for cervical and lumbar traction, I'm hoping. Let's cross our fingers. Let's cross our fingers that COVID goes away. But with that traction that we're doing either in cervical or lumbar bodies, the goal is to open up those spinal segments to promote mobility of the spinal segments. Same idea here. If we're separating the joint surfaces, we help reduce a little bit of pain and it's gonna help with mobility. I talked about that in Kines, that mobilizations, right? Grade one, grade two, grade three, grade four, grade fives, are used to help facilitate mobility of those joints and help with those capsular patterns. Stretching, right? Do we stretch joints or do we stretch muscles? Right, we traditionally stretch muscles. That doesn't mean you can't elongate the joint capsules, right? But they have a limited amount of elasticity, whereas the muscles have a much greater elasticity, so they can stretch a lot farther, right? And that's where we get into the muscle spindles and all that fun stuff. A quick stretch can facilitate the muscle spindles to fire. And, you know, normally when I'm doing this demonstration in the classroom, I will demonstrate kind of quick stretch. A quick stretch is not a novice clinician move. It, you know, if you're don't know about P, uh, don't know PNF very well, and you're kind of worried about doing PNF, you don't want to add quick stretch to your repertoire until you fully grasp the concept of the movements because you can actually injure a patient by doing quick stretch inappropriately. So literally quick stretch, when I have this position here, which I talked, I did a little bit ago, and I come out here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring that arm out and I'm going to pop that arm when I'm out in the end position. So here, and I can actually feel when I get out there and do that motion, my arms start contracting in the opposite direction and go opposite because of that muscle spindle reflex or that stretch reflex. But a key thing here is, as a novice clinician, especially you guys as students, please extremely, extreme, extreme, extreme care with that. That is an advanced clinician move. And honestly, for the most part, it's a PT move because that's gonna require a heavy, heavy, heavy assessment of what the patient can tolerate. And unless you've worked with your PT for a long time and your PT knows your ability and you know your PT's ability and your PT is confident in you, that's not something I'm gonna do with every patient. And especially, you know, little old Millie, you do that for her and the next thing you know, she's got an anterior dislocation of the shoulder. So you gotta be careful, but it can cause the reverse firing and trigger that irradiation effect. But the stretch reflex will not work on a flaccid muscle. What manual muscle grade is flaccid? Zero, good, right? And we talked about this. At a zero, and even up to a one, really doing any type of neuro e stim or even stim like that, it's not going to help because that muscle's shot, right? That nerve, it may be that nerve is ripped off that neuromuscular junction. You've got a severe impingement somewhere else. So quick stretch is not a good thing to do with somebody that's got no muscular control at all. So if you've got no muscular control, there's nothing going into that, or that muscle, you run a heavy risk of tearing that muscle up. With positioning, you're going to position yourself in the diagonal you're going to do. And the reason you're gonna do that is twofold. Number one, it provides the patient with a key direction of flow. They know if you're going up and out, you're going to be standing up there where that arm can go up and out and where it can come down and in. If you're at a weird position, it doesn't allow them to have a good idea where it's going. It also does not allow you to have a good kind of feel for the patient and good body mechanics, right? 
PNF is going to come into play with you having to have really, really good body mechanics. The people that are good at PNF have good body mechanics and don't kill their backs. If you're constantly finding yourself bending and twisting when you're doing PNF, you need to reassess your body position because eventually you're going to get somebody with a leg like mine that, you know, is 165 pounds and you're going to do one of those bends and twists with my leg and something's going to pop. And one of the things we want to stress with you guys is a healthy, <coughs> excuse me, sorry, a healthy spine leads to a healthy career. Once you injure your spine, you just have a tendency to re constantly re-injure that, and it gives, gives you one of those nagging problems. You don't want to have that if you want to have a long, healthy, functional career. So you've got to be using good body mechanics. That means getting the bed up where they're not, you're not bending way over with the patient, right? But it also means you're not so high up that you're leaning back every time you're working with the patient. And, you know, I, I can speak from example, you know, I've got a nagging low back injury from both years of martial arts and years of football, and then also have being thrown over parallel bars by a patient. You know, sometimes if I do something just a little bit weird, you know, maybe I'm transferring a patient for whatever reason, I do just a little bit of rotation with my core. All of a sudden I'm walking out of that room going, okay, where's that ice pack set? Because man, that hurt. Don't let yourselves get that way. Some of you may already have some nagging back injuries. If you do, it's all that more important for you to use good body mechanics. So what are some contraindications to PNF? Inflammatory arthritis. Oh, yes, yeah, Dr. Reskin said she really hurt her back lifting a patient too. It's amazing how easy it is. And it can be a really tiny patient, right? I could be, you know, transferring, you know, a, a kid who's 70 pounds. That 70 pounds is enough to tear something. It doesn't matter the size of the patient. The bigger patients you obviously want to be more cautious with, but any patient can. Inflammatory arthritis. So that does that mean that if a patient's got psoriatic arthritis or they've got rheumatoid arthritis or they've got osteoarthritis, PNF is out? No. But if they're in an acute inflammatory phase of that arthritis, you've got to be careful because we talked about this before. Maybe do passive PNF. But if you're in that acute flare and you start getting them torquing on that arm, torquing, not twerking, you're going to kick that inflammation up and can actually make that inflammation worse. Malignancy. What does malignancy equal? Right, a tumor. If the patient has a tumor, especially in the area we're treating, you have to be careful. We don't want to cause that tumor to metastasize, right, to spread. Let's say a patient has, I don't know, let's give they have colon cancer. Does that mean we can't work on the shoulder? No, but whose decision is it then what is appropriate and what is not appropriate? The PT, good, right? We don't decide that. We don't suddenly come up and go, well, you know, I think PNF would be great for this patient and just do it. We want to make sure we run everything by the PT so the PT knows what we are doing. Not only that, but so the PT can document what they feel is an appropriate treatment. Maybe they haven't thought of PNF and you're like, hey, you know, Bob in 301, you know, he's got some issues with his hand flexion. I'd really like to try some, maybe some D2 PNF in the extension to see if maybe we can get it to grasp for me. And honestly, some of the PTs are like, oh, yeah, like the one I talked to this morning. Oh, I didn't even think of that. Sure, let's give it a try and let's make sure that we've got it documented that you can do that, right? Again, always make sure our document trail follows what we're allowed to do. Bone disease, especially brittle bone disease. Resistive PNF and actually most resistive exercises are contraindicated. A bone fracture, specifically what type of bone fracture do we want to avoid doing any type of motion with? What's our big contraindication? when it is not set in place, or oh, physioplate, okay, yeah, that, that'd be a good one, right? That acute, unstable fracture, right? Where the doctor hasn't assessed it yet, we don't know where the bone pieces are, right? Because let's think of it, let's say I have a femoral fracture, and you start moving my leg around, because I don't know, I don't know why you did it. But maybe I have a little sliver of bone that suddenly slides medial, 
and nicks that femoral artery. Is that going to be good times for the patient? Nope, right? That femoral artery is going to cause them to bleed out into their leg. So when you have those unstable fractures, that's a wave off, right? I've had it where I went in to see, you know, Suzanne. And I go in to see Suzanne and she's like, oh, it's so nice to see you, Sonny. Yeah, let's get, let me get up and walk. And hey, last night, you know, I did fall and something's cracking in my hip every time I move it. Let's get up. How about not? Let's get the PT. Let's get the nurse. Did you tell the nurse she fell last night? Oh, I didn't want to bother her. You know, it really hurts. And it's awful black and blue. Right? Those are warning signs we got to be paying attention to. Congenital bone deformities. I showed you guys my uh, x-ray on my neck, right, at C3, where I've got that C3, 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 C4 cervical fusion. Even a PT would not want to do traction on my cervical neck at that level because if they're congenitally fused, they're not going to pull apart. That's kind of the way they're designed. They were born that way. Right? So any type of congenital bone deformity, we want to avoid going against. Patient has club foot, and the club foot was never corrected. We're not going to try to evert their foot. Well, hold on. I know your foot's like this. Well, we're going to get it to go like this. No. It just makes sense. So the patterns are the common things you're going to hear. Do we need a 10-minute break before we get into this? Please. Okay. So I, I remember if you need the break, you got to kind of, I can't see your faces now. So I can't tell when they're starting to go like this. Right. So let's, I, I was detecting, I wasn't getting as much response here. So let's go ahead and we'll, t we'll take a tenner. Let me get my little timer up here. Where is my share screen? Stop share. Pause recording. And we are resumed. So we're gonna start talking about PNF. And if you talk PNF with most people, share screen, what most people know is the patterns. That's all they think PNF is, is the patterns. They don't understand the rest of PNF. And we're gonna talk about the rest of PNF, but if you go and ask uh, any PT that's out in the field, what's PNF? Oh, they'll say, oh, it's these patterns with the arms and the legs. It is, but it's also a lot more than that. But we're going to start with talking about the patterns. So for each upper extremity and each lower extremity, there is a D1 and a D2 pattern. What do you think the D stands for? Duh, this is the direction it goes. No. Diagonal. Good, right? So the D is the diagonal. So I have a couple of different representations of the patterns in here. This is kind of looking at those patterns. I think this is way too complicated, and this confuses me. So what I did for you guys is I really broke them down into nice little, like, simple one-sheet things that you can keep in your binder. So you could just print these sheets and have them for yourself in the clinic. It helps make things just a little bit easier on you and a little bit easier to remember. So we're going to start talking about D1 and D2. So I'm, I'm going to start upper extremity. I'm going to talk about the motions, and then we're going to talk about the specifics, OK? So a D1 pattern with the upper extremity is going to start down and out and come up and in. That is D1. We'll get into the specifics of where the hand position is and stuff like that in a little bit. But that is a specific. So looking at this, what could you call this to help remember it? Is there anything you can think of this looks like? Yes, this is called the self-feed pattern, right? A lot of times what you'll hear people say is the patient eats the apple, the patient throws the apple away. Eat the if there is. Tyler, just see up, see? It's kind of universal how that is. Eating the apple and throwing it away. 
So that is D1. And again, we'll get into the specifics in a second. I just want you to see the patterns. D2 starts across, down and in, and goes up and out. Slide back some more here. Down and in, up and out. And I'm going to record us doing that in, uh, next week so that you have a good recording of it. So down and in, up and out. So what would you call this one? Some people call this a Saturday Night Fever. Seatbelt works, right? Other people say, I draw my sword and I throw it away. And I put my sword away. I draw my sword and I throw it away. And then I put my sword away. I don't know how... Big and loud technique. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. I might have to look that up. Yeah, I'm not sure how, if you throw your sword away, how you, it must be a dancing sword. It comes right back to your hand so you can do it. It's, um, whose sword was that? That's Freyr's sword from Norse mythology. The sword that fought by itself. No? No one's a Norse mythologist here? Sad. All right, so, Mjolnir, Mjolnir, and Greppengir, the gloves. Anyway, so those are the basic patterns. So D1 starts down and out, comes up and in, down and out, up and in, down and out. D2, down and in, up and out. Down and in, up and out. Motion's overall the same. So let's not worry about hand position, but just get yourself a little bit of space. And let's kind of get the idea of the patterns down together. So pick an arm, whichever arm you want. Start it with it behind your back, palm backwards. And then you're going to close your fist and bring it up and across and feed yourself. Take a bite of that apple. And then you're going to open the hand and throw the apple away. So up and in, down and out. Up and in, down and out. Up and in, down and out. And sometimes just this simple pattern here, right, which is a functional rotational pattern, although I'm not doing all of the motions exactly perfectly, is enough to get somebody's arm to start functioning and start working, where I can just kind of do this with them and it gets their memory going back to their arm that they have an arm and that it's functional. No, we're gonna talk about nerve flossing then. Good question. So Tyler asked if these are the same as nerve flossing. You can end up flossing your nerve in some of these positions, though, Tyler. Certainly when we get up to D2 and we're up in kind of this weird position up here, you certainly can get some nerve flossing going on. And even back here, you can get a little bit of it going on. <coughs> Excuse me. So let's do D2. Pick your other arm. So you're going to put your hand on the hilt of your sword or buckle your seatbelt. Reach down, unbuckle the seatbelt. Up and out. Grab that seatbelt, pull it down, pull your sword down, put it back in the sheath, down and in. Up and out. Down and in. Up and out. Down and in. Up and out. And notice nowhere in there was I giving very specific commands. Just really simple contextual uh <clears throat> Excuse me. Simple contextual clues. All right. Yeah, I'm going to go into the specifics upper extremity, and we'll start lower extremity next time. So this pattern here talks about whether we're going into flexion or extension. When you're talking about flexion or extension with your diagonal patterns, you are talking about the largest joint that is moving is your key. So for the D1, the upper extremity patterns, your motion is dedicated by the shoulder joint. For the D1, D2 lower extremities, it's by the hip. 
So if it says D1, right? So this is D1 here. D1 flexion is this motion here because my shoulder is flexing. Even though it's not moving much, it's coming up into flexion. D1 extension is that pattern. It's going into extension. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, yeah, that would work. I mean, it's, that actually is even further along the martial arts kind of theory, so that could work, Kaylee. I just never heard it called that, so maybe I just, I'm, and there probably is, I'm getting, betting there's probably an NDT theory to that, and I just am not familiar with it. Uh, NDT is neurodevelopmental theory, I'm sorry. It's, again, more neuro nerd stuff. So with D2, this is my flexion pattern because my shoulder is in flexion. This is my extension pattern because if I kept going past my body, or I could, it would go back into extension. You need to understand those terms between what's flexion and what's extension. Traditionally, if you're going to do uh, PNF with a patient, you're going to do both flexion and extension patterns, but you may do one actively and one passively. You may do both actively. It just depends upon what you're working with and what your goals are for the patient. So again, D1 is a self-feed pattern. So to start in flexion, you're going to start out here out the side. The shoulder is going to flex, right? So it's going to come up here. It's going to adduct, and it's going to externally rotate. So that's the motion of the shoulder. The scapula is elevated, right? It's abducted, and it's upwardly rotated. I can't get into flexion without it. The elbows are interesting because the elbows and knees can either be in flexion or extension depending upon the pattern. Most times, if the shoulder is in flexion or the hip is in flexion, the elbow is in flexion. But there are some theories that will leave it in extension, and again, that's another more neuro stuff. So I'm going to go with the elbow flexion because that's more traditional. The radial ulnar joint is in supination. Am I in supination right now? For the most part. Wrist is flexed and radially deviated. And my phalanges, which are my fingers, are flexed and adducted, adducted, which means they're in a fist. So I'm kind of in this pattern here. I can't get the radial deviation because I don't have much. So I'm going to start out here. Flex the shoulder. Adduct the shoulder. Externally rotate. Elevate the scapula. Bend the elbow. Supinate the forearm. Flex the wrist. Flex the fingers. Radially deviate. Whew, that's a lot of motions with one motion. And then to go the opposite, I'm going to extend my shoulder, abduct it, internally rotate, depression, adduction, downward rotation. Again, flexion or extension depending upon your motion, but in this case, it's typically going to be elbow extension. Move my arms out of my way here. Radial ulnar is pronation, palm down. Wrist extended, ulnar deviated. I can't extend and ulnar deviate. I'm, my hand's tight. And fingers are open and spread. So here, close, bring it across, radial deviate, up and across. Open, out and down. And when we do this, I like to use the patient's hand to kind of get me to go. So they're going to grab, come up and across. I'm going to go on the back side of their hand. They're going to open up and push out and away. That's a lot of motion. I'm going to key you in here. The wrist and hand are important, but they're not as important as the other motions in gross motor movement. If you are working in fine motor therapy, specifically like hand therapy or foot therapy when we get into it, yes, your hand and wrist motions are important, but the majority of the motion that you really need to worry about Shoulder, elbow, forearm, and maybe wrist. I don't worry so much about where my fingers are 100% of the time. So out here, up and in, down and out. 
You don't have to do that. And that's where, so here's the deal, Renee. I do that when I'm working with a, a patient that I'm doing resistive therapy. But what if my problem is I can't open my fist? That's my problem. Then what I'm hoping is by extending, abducting, inwardly rotating, extending the elbow, extending the wrist, I'm hoping by doing all of those motions, my hand naturally opens. It's kind of the same idea. If I can't close my hand, I'm going to try flexing the shoulder, bringing everything up and across. And because I brought this all up and across, my hand closes naturally. That's where that irradiation comes in. But a lot of the patients you're going to work with, specifically with strokes, the problem is the, the proximal joints. They may have functional hand motion, but their shoulders start working. So then we're going to use the hands that maybe if I open my hand, that'll fire my wrist, that'll fire my forearm, that'll fire my elbow, that'll fire my shoulder, or my biceps, that'll fire my shoulder. Inward and outward rotation talk about the shoulder itself. So internal and external rotation. So think here's external, here's internal rotation, right? So when I'm looking at external rotation, I'm here, that's this position here. External rotation, that position here. A lot of times internal and external rotation will go along with supination and pronation. Does that make sense? Upward and downward rotation are going to be the scapula, right? So upward rotation, let me get a, my little drawer out here. So there's my scapula. Kind of looks like a misshapen Florida, backwards Florida. You know, nothing to be sorry about, Renee. You're okay. Upward rotation occurs with shoulder flexion, right? So when that goes up, this tip comes up. So now I'm here, and I look like that. That's upward rotation. Downward rotation are where that tip goes down. That's downward rotation. Does that make sense? I don't even know what I just drew there. That's fantastic. Probably some of my best drawing right there. You can go through the process. Yep, it's a fluid motion. Yes. So, here's the deal. When you're starting off your motion, you don't always have to get them into the perfect motion to start. Just start whether up in flexion or start in extension, whichever you're going to start it. So, start with the hand in the basic position you're in. So our shoulder is going to flex, adduct, externally rotate. Scap at that point is already elevated, upward rotated, and a little bit of abduction. Elbow flexes for the most part. Elbow, again, is going to primarily follow the shoulder, but it may not always. So depending upon the neuro theory, again, that's why I put flex, extension flexion. For the most part, follows the shoulder, right? Radial ulnar is supinated already. My wrist is in flexion, radial deviation. My, and honestly, as soon as I flex my wrist, my fingers come in. So I'm coming here, all the way up and across. Flex, 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 flex. I can't get radial deviated because I have none. Damn it. Darn it. I mean. And then going the opposite, opening the fingers up, splaying them nice and wide. Owner deviated and extended out down here. And what you'll find is when you do this, if you lead with the hand and you lead with the foot, kind of getting those in your mindset, that will cue you into doing everything else. Thinking through it slowly. So when I first started doing PNF, these sheets were my guideline. I even brought them with me to treatment. And I gave them like, so we're going to go over these together. And I gave my patient a copy of them because it made me look like I'm teaching something. But really what I wanted is I wanted a copy of them handy. And when I did them for the first time, I legitimately would go through, okay, shoulder flexion. Uh, and I'd go through the motions. If that helps you, talk yourself through the motions. If it doesn't help, you don't do it. 
some people that really messes them up. They'd rather just go through the flow of motion, fluid motion and do it. All right, let's talk D2. So let's get D2 up here. D2 flexion ends up here. D2 extension ends down here. So we're going to just start with the hand down here, just out of the way so we can get the idea. To go into the D2 flexion, we're going to flex the shoulder, abduct the shoulder, externally rotate the shoulder. The scap is already elevated and upward rotating and slightly abducted, right? Elbow is going to follow this point, the direction we're going. So now we're going into extension out here. Oh, God, there's radial nerve. Radial ulnar is in supination, right? Up, wrist extended, radially deviated, and fingers spread. This position out here, if a lot of you hold it, your uh, thumb and your two first fingers should probably go numb because what nerve is being stretched at this point? What nerve innervates these fingers right here? It's, it's the radial partially, but it's a lot also the medial. So you're going to feel it going down. The radial you'll feel over here for me. But then when you get way back there, you'll feel medium. So radial starts when you get here. You get that numbness kind of in the thumb, like the, the medial aspect of the, or the, the more proximal aspect of the thumb. And then when you get way back, your fingers will go, nope, I'm angry. And that's medium. So you get a combination of both. And it just depends upon where the hand ends up if you get more medial or if you get more radial. It's funny. So again, shoulder flexed, abducted, externally rotated. Elbow extend, supination, wrist extension, radial deviation, fingers spread. And I'm way back here. I'm almost like a server's position, right? That's, it feels not good. So that's the ending position. And you got to be careful when you're doing that again because it may not feel good for every patient. Then the extension motion is going to be the opposite. So I'm going to extend the shoulder, adduct the shoulder, internally rotate the shoulder. When I'm here already, I'm kind of in that position where I'm locked up. My elbow is going to flex slightly. I can't flex a lot because I've got body in the way. Right? Radial owners in pronation. Palm is down. Wrist is flexed and ulnar deviated. Think of it, if I'm grabbing a hold of a sword, my wrist has to kind of be like that. And my phalanges are flexed and adducted, also known as a fist. So that's the position I go into when I put the sword back in the sheath. I wanted to stand up so you can kind of see a little bit closer picture of that extension pattern. So flexion, I'm going to start there, and I'm going to do all the opposite motions. Ow. Sorry, that was a zinger on my median nerve. Whew. Right? And so if I did that quick stretch out there, that would probably hurt. But so from here, up and out, down and in. And what we will do as a group is we'll have people walk. What I found works really well is for instruction, have, if you're going to practice this at home, have somebody read these to you while you're doing the pattern. So if you have your significant other or whatever, don't have a kid because they'll be like, self holder, plethen. No, just kidding. That's not how kids talk. But having them read it can help you move them through the patterns. Whew. That was a lot of stuff just going through that. I want to demonstrate the leg patterns. And then we're going to call it a day. We're not going to go into the specifics of the leg patterns yet. All right, so leg patterns. We have D1 and D2. I don't know if I'll be, how much I'll be able to demonstrate these. I might have to tilt the camera here. So hold on. All right, that should give you a little bit better. Yeah, OK. I'm going to pretend that I'm laying down. I can do these in standing. but So D1 pattern. Let me get that brought up here on the sheet. So D1, again, flexion and extension is going to be based upon 
the hip, right? So if you look, it's going to end up, so if D1 starts out here and comes up and in, out, up and in, out, up and in. So what would you call that? Come up with the term. Yes, good. That's pretty much what I remembered it as all throughout my years. Hacky sack. Right? So you're coming here, kicking the hacky sack, going back down, kicking the hacky sack. That is D1 pattern. We haven't gotten the specifics of the foot position or anything like that yet, but that's the pattern. So we're down and out, toes pointed, up and in. Down and out, up and in. Down and out, up and in. That's D1. D2 is probably the most uncomfortable pattern to do. So D2 starts with the legs crossed. Can I slide back anymore? Tilt it down a little bit more. There we go. It's about as much as I'm going to get tilt here. I'm getting tilted. Starts with the legs crossed. So that is that way. Down and in. We're going to bring it up and out. Down and in. Up and out. Down and in. Up and out. That's probably the most uncomfortable one to do. It just popped. Yeah. So what do you call that one? So here to here. My term for that is dog peeing on a fire hydrant. Right, because it does. Look, I'm looking like a dog peeing on a fire hydrant when I'm out here. Right? Some people call it the river dance. I don't know. I think peeing on a fire hydrant helps me remember it more. Right, so I have hacky sack, and I have fire hydrant. We have self-feed, throw away the sword. Whatever names help you remember them, doesn't matter what you call them. Um, I'm bring this back up now. Look at my palm. I'll say that, is Dr. Reskin still with us? No, Dr. Freskin doesn't like me using the term peeing on a fire hydrant. Says it's not the most uh, professional, but I guarantee you, if you're working with a patient and you teach them the peeing on the fire hydrant, PNF pattern, they will remember it, right? Think about your mnemonics for remembering the carpal bones or the uh, cranial nerves. Did you remember the clean mnemonics? Oh, once one takes the anatomy final, very good vacations are heavenly. Is that the one you remembered or was it something else? I'm guessing something how, something very fine, something feels heavenly. It's probably what you remembered. And same thing with the hand, right? There's one that's like, or the, the or like the cranial nerves. Some say money matters, but my brother says big business matters more. I'm sure that's what you remembered. Same idea here. It's same for the patients. Patients remember stuff that you give them. Some people will call that a outside hacky sack, and then the other one's inside hacky sack. Whatever helps you remember them. That external, that D2 pattern of flexion with that hip, that can be really painful for people because you're heavily going to be abducted at that point. And that really stretches that groin out. And like uh, Dylan said, his hip popped. It'll happen quite frequently, right? So just be aware of that. There's not gonna be a ton of motion in that leg. And you've also got to think when we get to practicing, not everyone's leg weighs the same, right? You lift my leg, versus, you know, lifting Emily's leg. It's going to be a totally different experience. 
because, you know, my leg probably weighs as much as Emily weighs total. And so you've got to be thinking about that and getting mentally prepared doing these, thinking about who your patient is. You go into an 800-pound patient, even to do upper extremity PNF, it's a lot of weight to move around. I'm going to stop share here. Stop recording.